the artist Mikael Jenberg, who um, you might be familiar with, he uh, is trying to put a little red house on the moon. He says that he, his audience is all the 10-year-olds in the world and the 10-year-old inside of himself. The next speaker realized something really important when she was 10. She realized learning can be fun. And since then, she's taken it on as a furious mission of spreading it to as many people as possible all the time. And she's been doing that through being an artist, an advocate for change, a writer, a researcher. She is a professor at the University of the Arts in London, but she's also a director of 172 schools, and it's really schools. It's not a cool name for museums, it's schools in the south of London. She wrote a book that you probably have read parts of, or the whole of, it was called The Wow Factor. And it spread uh, like wildfire through the world. Uh, it was a mission for UNESCO that turned into a very big adventure. Uh, and she's been lecturing and talking about The Wow Factor for many years. And you can find the book uh, in more than 40 countries. She's a professional troublemaker and a mom. And her name is Anne Bamford. Welcome. It's lovely to be here. And it, it, I wanted to start by saying, don't worry if people come to the museum and don't learn because people come to schools all the time and don't learn. And so they're actually paid for learning and don't achieve it. So I guess I'm just saying go sort of steady on yourself. And there's actually research to show that because I conducted a, a large European study and it was a very scientific study. And when you do a very scientific study, you have to have the control group and you have the group that has the, the intervention, the thing you change. And so we had to pre-test and we had to post-test to see exactly what had changed. And within the school system, within all the 11 countries where we did the research, within all the children we worked with, within all the teachers we worked with, we found that when we post-tested the children, so we tested them after the period of three months of concentrated learning in their school, they knew less than when they begin. Now actually, I think that's at the heart of learning, to know less than when you began. And so I actually want to say the role of the, uh, the, role of the, the museums, the cultural institutions or organisations is to make you ask questions. So actually when you leave, sorry, you don't have more knowledge. You actually start asking questions about the things you thought you knew. And you start to actually unlearn stuff, perhaps, that you've learned. So you actually come out of the museum knowing less, being less certain than when you came in the museum. And I want to tell you a little story about, it comes from Melbourne, which is in Australia, which is where I was born. I was actually born in Tasmania, not in Melbourne, the little island at the bottom. And I was in Melbourne only a couple of years back. And in Melbourne, the streets are very hard to cross because it's got trams and it's got traffic and it's, you know, there's, it's sort of chaotic. And unlike Swedish people, Australian people are not very law-abiding. And so nobody waits till the crossing can be safe. You try and sort of take the risk, right? And there was a mother and her child. The child was about six and they were going to cross the road. But in the middle of the road, some bright person has put a big sculpture, okay? Just to add to the chaos is this great big sculpture. And the sculpture is a modernist sculpture. Don't even know who did it. I can't remember. But it's a modernist sculpture and it's big and it's all sort of bits of broken metal. And the little child said, what's that? 
And the mother said, I don't know. She was concentrating on crossing the road. And the child persisted. Mum, what's that thing in the middle of the road? And then the mother sort of in desperation said, that's art. <laughs> oh. What's it there for, said the little boy. And the mother said, so little boys ask stupid questions. Now actually, she's right. She's right. It's there to make us ask questions. It's not there to give us learning. It's not there to give us answers. So how does the learning department within a cultural institution or the people that have to make it ask questions? How does your organisation ask questions? Now, I think we, the first question we have to look at is what is the ideal space for asking questions? Because if that's at the heart of what it actually means to learn, if schools are very good at making us know less than we knew before, then we must be onto something there. Now, when you look at what happens in schools, nine out of ten children say they learnt something better when they weren't inside a classroom. 90% of children. Interestingly, 90% of their teachers also say the children learn something better when they're not inside the classroom. The more experienced a teacher is, the more likely they're ta to take the children outside the classroom. So what is it that happens outside the classroom that makes the child learn? I think it's about asking questions. It's the interruption as you cross the road and the thing is there that makes you ask the question. It's that taking the child outside the environment or the adult. It's the same thing. I love seeing the project for the older people because we did a great project with older people and choreographers from the Royal Academy of Dance. And it made the older people ask a whole lot of questions that they hadn't asked for a long time. Now this is a real challenge because as a director of schools, I'm building a new school in London. I'm building the school in Battersea. You can go online and watch a live little movie of the school being built. It's costing me 30 million pounds to build this school. But my question is, why am I doing it? Because if I spent that 30 million pounds taking the children outside of the school, 90% of them would learn better. And so there's the first question about today, as we build museums, what sort of thing do we actually need? Now, it's ages since UNESCO has had this idea of tangible heritage, i.e. bits and pieces of things, and intangible heritage, the heritage that we hold inside our thoughts, the songs we learnt from childhood, our stories, all of those things. So the first question is, what space is the right sort of space for those things to emerge? I was invited to Hong Kong and southern China to do an evaluation there where we reviewed the whole cultural provisions because Hong Kong's about to build this amazing cultural quarter. Even the land didn't exist. They're going to reclaim the land, build the museums and the, the concert halls and so on. And I was to go out and say, how, you know, young people, what will we build there that makes it absolutely enticing for you to go there? You know what the young people wanted? Space. Space. They didn't want a building. They actually wanted just empty space. Because if you're a young person in Hong Kong, housing is very expensive, so you live in these very tight units, you go in a very controlled way to your school environments, you don't have the space to actually learn. So what sort of thing are you going to have for people as they move forward? What type of environment would you seek? I think we can actually look a little bit about what's happening in retail. Now, not I'm saying that every museum has to be a retail space, quite the opposite. But initially, if you're in somewhere like England, you started with a high street. So you had a sort of precinct 
where you would have your shops. Now, actually, most museums are sort of like that. You have, there's the museum -y bit in a city, right? And you're all smiling. You know where I mean here, right? So you have the museum -y bit. And if you want a museum, you go to the museum -y bit. Now, that's great because you can wander along and you can have a look in the window and you might see something you've not been surprised about. But then we started to have them all, you know, the shopping centre, the grand feast of retail, right? And that is what we've also seen emerging in some parts of the world in relation to museums and cultural centres, this idea of some massive sort of mega cultural village. In, in Hong Kong, it's this cultural quarter, you know, this whole reclaimed bit of land where they can bung a lot of cultural stuff there. And people can come across from China on the high-speed train and do culture. By the way, they want to fill it with European culture because it's cheaper to, than going across to Europe and it's sort of safer if we don't send too many people to another side of the world. So it has, let's bring it here to us. But if you look where retail is now, You've got a lot of online retail. We buy things that are sort of secondhand and reconstituted. We bid for things on eBay. We buy it off Amazon. We, we use on online, then we get it delivered to our house. We have pop-up stores. Some of the most exciting stores in London are, are in, in little tin sheds that sort of pop up on wasteland. I went to a concert that was held in a car park. It was brilliant, right? I th saw a theatre, I haven't been there yet, but I'm going to go, a theatre where you sit in hot tubs on the roof of a building and you watch the movie, right, while you're in the water. Right? Quirky in London when it's so cold. But anyway, so it started to really stretch the boundaries of what we need. And I was liking the way other people have talked about this idea of what's exciting at the minute. And this idea of these sort of micro experiences that began with the makers. In England, I was involved in a project where we put together the old people who participate in the, in the Women's Institute, right? Average age, probably about 75. Then we got the really cool art students and we put them together to start knitting on the underground trains. Now, if you've ever been to London, who's been to London, right? Who's ridden on the underground? Most of you, right? The whole thing about riding on the underground, which I didn't learn until I'd been in the, in the place about a year, was that you make no recognition of the other humans around you, right? Because you've got to, even if you're pressed in the most um, sexual manner up against some person, you must deliberately notice that you're not. So you sort of have to get this bland expression. So there's a lot of practice of not having any contact, right? And ideally, you have a newspaper because that's like a defence weapon, right? So you can sort of hold it there. And people started knitting on trains, right? And most of the young art students didn't know how to knit. So they had to rely on the knowledge, the intangible understanding that came from the Women's Institute people. And it was quite quirky to see the dreadlock person sitting next to the grey-haired lady with the blue rinse knitting together on the train. But the result was people started talking. People started asking questions. You know, what are you doing? You know, now that is normally never done on the underground. No matter what happens, you ignore those sort of basic things. Now, in that case, I would say it developed a cultural institution, right? It started a cultural institution. So, often it's happening at a very local level. Now, I'd argue there are two sides to this. There's participation and relevance, right? And you can see them almost as like a cross like this. I sometimes put it as a slide. I don't want to use a slide today. You get activities where there's really high participation, but it's not at all relevant. Now, I can force people in schools or in society, you must go to the museum. And when I do that, if I force them, usually what they say is, but my feet hurt, it was tiring, I didn't really enjoy it. 
And so you've got high participation but low relevance. But then there's also the art project, and sorry, you're all guilty of this one, which is the one that you make a really superb project that's absolutely brilliant, but nobody turns up for it, right? Yeah, you're all smiling, you've done it, you know. When the museum educators outnumber the attendees, right? <laughs> now, I don't know if you've noticing, just have a look on the screen behind us. I've been watching this guy, this yellow jumpered guy, running along there, the whole time I've been sitting here, he keeps running along there, must be absolutely exhausted, <laughs> right? But he's never gone into the, the photography place behind him, right? He hasn't stopped. I hoped he was going to pop in, right? But there are lots of barriers preventing him popping in. Museums often have big, heavy doors for a starter, right? You know, the grander the door, the better the museum is a sort of general principle, right? And doors are not usually very welcoming, right? You don't usually sort of barge up to big doors and go, oh, I think I'll go in here. So that's point number one. Point number two is I don't see anything as I'm running past that gives me a hint that there's wonderful photography inside there, right? Because I have to actually make that commitment. I have to actually decide that I need to go to see some photographs. Right? You've got to force yourself outside the area that you're in. Now, there are lots of barriers that prevent people from making that decision. I was involved in a, a big evaluation of a cultural entitlement that they started in, in London, in England. This idea was to say everybody should have five hours a week of it. You know, they agreed that was the dose, that once you had five hours a week, you'd have done your bit, all right? And what they said is, why don't you attend? And there were three different types of people. There were those people who go, right, the attendees. There are people who don't go, but they don't have anything against it. So when you say, what do you think in museums? They go, oh, yeah, they're nice. Have you ever been? No, right? But they don't sort of have a negative view. Then you have the people who don't go, and actually, they don't want to go, right? What do you think of museums? Oh, waste of money. Don't want to go, right? So you have these three types of people. When you look at the two types who don't go, this is the reasons they don't go. Transport. Now, for young people, they say it's too expensive, it's too difficult. For old people, they're frightened. Ooh, that means I've got to go on the tube. It's hard to do. Because remember, in England, most museums are free for everybody. Right? So it's not expensive to actually go in the door. They want to go with other people. They want friends to go with them. They don't want to go on their own. They're frightened of crime. And that's a real key thing in cultural uh, institutions. If the concert doesn't finish till 11 o'clock at night, how are you going to get back safely if you're on your own? So practical questions. Also, the definition of whether it's a learning place or not was very interesting. Because for posh middle class people, they said that museums are part of education. For not posh, not middle class people, they said museums were part of entertainment. Now, when you compare culture to other in education, i.e. school or university or college, then the museum actually looks quite good. So, would you rather go to school or would you rather go to a concert? Oh, I'd rather go to a concert. But if you look at it from entertainment point of view, it can look rather bad. Would you like to go to the football or would you rather go to a museum? It suddenly has a different sort of connotation to the person who's going to it. I'm aware that time is just about up, but I wanted to share with you something that John helped me with, a piece of homework that I did last night. Because one of the things that prevented people coming, even though it's free, is how you make them feel welcome. And we were talking about the cafeterias, the, the restaurant, the cafe, that's always within the museum space or in the cultural institution space. By and large, in most places, it's not very friendly to the average member of the public. The food is expensive. 
it's weird, isn't it? You know, like this is where you'll get the beetroot chutney and all these sort of things, isn't it? Right? You're with me now. You're thinking, eh, you know, it, it's all couscous and beetroot on everything, right? So when you take your kids into that place, the place itself doesn't welcome. And I threw out the challenge. Can you think of any museums where the caterers for the museum are McDonald's? I don't actually like McDonald's, right? So don't, don't worry. But I'm just thinking about accessibility. The National Trust in England was seen to be very unfriendly to children. And it introduced this idea that for £3.95, a child can get a paper bag and fill it with whatever food they want. There's like a little selection of food. And it's cheap, good food for a child. Suddenly, people are bringing children in, right? So the McDonald's challenge. And thank you, John. Where's John? I can't see. Thanks, John, for this. Uh, this is museums, cultural institutions with the McDonald's restaurants. Give a cheer for the Californian Science Center. The Smithsonian Air Space Museum. This one surprised me from France. The Louvre. Way. Windsor Castle was listed, but that's a cheat because Windsor Castle happens to be in the middle of Windsor and there is a McDonald in Windsor, but it's not actually in the thing. And the Museum of, is it communism? Am I reading right? This one's really bizarre. <laughs> The Museum of Communism has a McDonald's in Prague. So, <laughs> well done. So, thank you so much for those and good luck with the work you're doing. I'm looking forward to our conversations today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm still at this... I, I, I really... Uh, have this beautiful movie playing in my head <laughs> from your talk. And I'm thinking about the empty space that the young people in Hong Kong wanted. And also the spaces that you uh, claim when you do your knitting project. Uh, I want to ask you a question about competence uh, here. Uh, if we w want to step out of uh, our boxes either by ripping them a little bit open, or by stepping out to an empty space or a new space. What are the competences that you uh, identify as uh, most vital for us to, to have and nurture and, and develop? I think the key one is actually about communication, becoming very good communicators. Um, because that's the first stage, is setting up the conversation. And I think collection actually is really, really important. And people have a natural love of collections of things. Um, and so it's about tapping in to that sort of, those, the human desire to be collectors of things, whether mm -hmm. it's collectors of stories or collectors of objects, and this notion of communication. When I was actually coming here at Heathrow, just near Heathrow, there was a whole lot of people sitting on a grass Hill, and I know this is weird British stuff, but they're the plane spotters, right? Mm -hmm. They're not train spotters, they're plane spotters, and they sit down, but they've all got these really expensive cameras and so on to take the photos, and they, they talk, and they're engaged. They are collectors, I don't know what they're collecting, but they mm -hmm. collect as at least of photos of planes, you know? So they're, they're a museum, they're the museum of plane collectors that meet ev every Sunday at Heathrow. Mm. And it's communication that brings those people together. Yeah. And it's sharing that collection, the thing that they all love. Mm. And the next step for them could be to come to our, our plain museum. Yeah, yeah. They could, they, well, they are. Mm. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you go Sunday afternoon mm. at 4 o'clock outside Heathrow, it's mm. the Plain Spotters muse Museum. Mm. You know, it's the cultural institution mm. for plain spotters. Yeah. Just one more question about this. I uh, recommend you go on your own, though, unless you take a thermos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th this transformative space, uh, building a school while knowing that learning takes place in other spaces. How do you how do you envision if you have a, a how do you envision that? Uh, where are we going with these houses and buildings that contain so much of our symbols for knowledge now? And where do you see that going? I think it's really tricky because 
we seem to need to build the building, even when there's no logic to building the building. But th we, you know, as I say, I'm still paying 30 million pounds for a school building when the children live across the river or, or go to school across the river from all of this amazing cultural stuff they could use. But we're still very attached to the sense of um, the solidness mm. of a building. We still want to spend mm. a lot of money on these buildings. So, and I'm in the same situation, so I don't mm. really have an answer no. to that one. I think it's a, it's a question to ask. Mm. Why do we still want to, to build those buildings? Mm. Why do I still want to build the building? Mm. I don't know. Mm. I, I haven't got the answer. The building is being built. Mm. Yeah, but it's okay. We can do it, do it after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> don't have the answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> um.